Well, anyway, the history of the the super shelter and how it how it uh, uh, developed over increments. The history of the Morris Kohansky super shelter. The time period is the 1980s. Morris was teaching a grade 10 school kids in winter conditions with about 30 centimeters, which is about 12 inches of snow on the ground. Winter conditions. The kids were in small groups of four. They were building arched lean-to type shelters using flexible uh, alders and birch saplings. And each shelter was to have an open front with a large parallel fire like this one as a heat source. At this time, Moores was transitioning from using uh, materials like canvas uh, and tarps into what he considered at the time a new space age material known as polyethylene or plastic. In the early days, before polyethylene, clear polyethylene, we used canvas. So, of course, if you're going to warm a shelter, you have to build a big fire in front of it. And uh, you can't cover the, the front because no uh, heating will take place, no capture of heat. So you build one of these shelters, it sheds the rain and it protects you from the wind. But you have to have an open front to get the benefit of a fire. So as you convert for cheaper materials when polyethylene became available, uh, the notion that never occurred to me that polyethylene allows the radiance of the sun or the radiance from a fire sort of goes through that and so when you completely cover a shelter uh, as these students did when they were given the uh, polyethylene I guess they made the assumption it was meant to cover the whole shelter <laughs> in front of the fire. Morris had given each group a large chunk of plastic and sent each group out to cover just the backs of their shelters. Later on Morris went to check on one group of kids and he noticed something that he had never encountered before. The kids had taken the polyethylene and completely covered the shelter from front to back. So right in the front was all covered up. And as I tour uh, to see uh, if, uh, you know, how the kids are all making out before I go to bed to myself, and this one particular sh uh, camp, there's uh, three or four kids in it, and uh, they have covered, including the front, between the fire and the and the front of the shelter, they have covered it completely. And as I walk by, I notice that the warmth that's developing inside the shelter was causing the polyethylene to balloon. And uh, as it, the, the front of the shelter, they didn't weigh it down. And actually, the warmth, uh, the intensity of their fire was such that actually the front of the shelter raised up and dumped its warm load of air and fell down again. And I never occurred to me that if you close the front of the shelter then the sparks couldn't come in and the smoke wouldn't come in and it would capture the warmth in there much more effectively than having an open fronted shelter where there was no means to capture whatever form uh, you know that captured warm air like the uh, like a igloo i mean an igloo, a greenhouse functions so that was uh, what you call an epiphany i would say the kids were laying on top of their sleeping bags with all of their jackets and ski pants off, apparently too hot and thrilled at their completed shelter. In the months following that uh, outing with those kids, uh, Morris worked on combining various shelter concepts into what he called the Morris Kohansky Super Shelter. He correctly surmised that the domed interior shape of the Inuit igloo could be incorporated into the design of the super shelter by using plastic instead of snow. But I had been studying how to build igloos. And the igloo construction, it has a bench that is about chair seat high so that the cold air can gravitate to the lowest spot. <coughs> then you got a, a, a ceiling that is highly reflective. The snow is very reflective. And there's this bubble that captures any warmth that's generated inside of an igloo. Um, it keeps it there. And it's kind of uh, counterintuitive that a bubble made out of snow captures temperatures that are well above melting. <coughs> and so on. And I said, oh, all these uh, features in an igloo that you have to incorporate to make the igloo work properly. Uh, what if I tried to do the same thing without using snow? 
Could I build a bench? Could I build a, a structure? Uh, the reflectivity of the ceiling would uh, uh, take the place of the reflectivity of the snow. And on and on. So here is the, I am building a structure that uh, the igloo has to incorporate to make it work properly. But I don't need snow to do it. Now, the first of all, uh, one of the easiest shelters to put up is to use uh, bendable material. Willows, alders, slender birch, something that uh, is thin enough that you can make an arch type shelter. And the advantage being that uh, you, all you need is a knife to cut these wands. And uh, it's a freestanding structure. But if a arch type shelter, you just throw something over it and uh, it's fast uh, and uh, it's simple and, and it's rare uh, not to find a place where you can't find material like that. And especially uh, if you stay small, if you're building a, a shelter for a single person, it's very easily done. Whereas uh, the next step is to build something in my way of thinking that houses three people. But we could find that if there is a suitable long material, which only in long, slurder, crowded birch, you could have six people sleep in the same shelter, that you've built something very quickly with arches and you cover it. And the simplicity of covering something like that is rectangular pieces of material. Now, when I first started, the coverage for this type, uh, I think uh, they call them benders in England. The structures that are built by sticking the ends in the ground or in the snow or whatever and then they're wound around each other to produce an arch and you make a series of these arches that may be right off about the idea from uh, native sweat lodges they were sort of built in that uh, construction which we expanded from there further innovations demonstrated the need for additional parachute or breathable fabric over top of the super shelter to provide fresh air exchange and a way to strengthen the shelter from the ravages of wind, rain and heavy snow load. One other thing that is not as obvious with an igloo is that uh, the igloo to really uh, function properly when the snow that you built your igloo with loses its porosity then actually becomes dangerous because when it's all iced up the byproducts of combustion of, an e of a kudlik or, or if you're trying to cook inside of the igloo then you'll capture so much of the offensive byproducts of combustion. So, so an igloo can only last as long as it doesn't glaze over. And if it glazes over, then it's sealed. And as a result, uh, uh, but anyway, so when you're building an igloo, you've got a window if, if you need a fire outside. You've got a uh, parachute was used to keep the wind from blowing everything away. So you'd cover all of that with parachute. But if you left a, a square meter or two on the downwind side, that would give you the fresh air, the fresh air yeah. so that the oxygen exchange. When I build a shelter out of polyethylene and um, uh, uh, mylar and whatever, uh, the, the, there is no, no opportunity to get fresh air. So you're apt to do yourself harm. I always sort of dealt with that by being careless as when you cover it, uh, make sure that there is opportunity for fresh air to get sure. under the edges. Yep. But if I purposely would put a down low, uh, fairly low, maybe bench-wise, I figured that it uh, had a lot to do to refresh the air. Oh, yeah. So to create a bubble, to create a window that allows radiance in, to have a bubble that captures the radiance, to have a portion of the uh, overhead bubble to be highly reflective, and to have a portion of the bubble that captures it is uh, porous enough yep. to uh, uh, help uh, get fresh oxygen also and to reduce the buildup of uh, moisture because you have a problem that polyethylene and mylar captures uh, you know the breath condensation. the amount of condensation and stuff like that yep. so one thing contributed to another and voila for want of a better name we uh, we uh, call it a super shelter the final innovation came later with the addition of a space age material called mylar, uh, which we also know as survival blankets. Just covering a framework with clear polyethylene 
that's essentially a greenhouse. But when you put the survival, uh, the very reflective material on the ceiling, you discover that generally uh, the, the temperature has to come up inside of the shelter before it gets, uh, has any benefit deep in the shelter. But the radiance, if it bounces off your ceiling, the whole length of your body is getting warm. You bet. And, and the, uh, the amount of heat that is lost because there's a general steady loss of, of warmth from inside the shelter, but it retains it long enough of great value. But if it reflects it, then you're you're getting the the uh, uh, more bounce for your ounce. So you're getting much more effect for your, uh, for whatever by having a ceiling. Now, if you add insulation to that, if you covered your your shelter with uh, with uh, fiberglass, <laughs> you would have the best of all possible worlds because it would take uh, take the place of the insulative value of the snow that sure. an igloo provides through the thickness of the snow. By adding the mirror-like surface to the inside of the super shelter, Moore's effectively created a modern adaptation of the reflective ceiling found in a glazed igloo interior. Thusly, the Morris Kohansky Super Shelter was launched into the bushcraft and survival world. And it really changed the way we think about modern survival kits and training. Even as I sit here with the fire going, one good step away from uh, my shelter, with this bubble of air trapped behind me, the heat I'm feeling from here is, is just amazing. Like, I'm ready to shed layers already and I haven't even got the window closed yet. <laughs> Let's take a look at the five components of a true Morris Kohansky super shelter. First of all, the raised bed. The raised bed is awesome because it gets you up off the ground and it is able to intercept the heat from the fire. Okay, so the fire doesn't actually heat perfectly sideways. It heats on a bit of a slope. The raised bed uh, should also be a comfortable sitting height and working height so that when I'm sitting around the fire, not sleeping, but actively working, maybe eating, maybe cooking, maybe working on a craft, maybe making cordage, that I'm comfortable. So in this case, I am quite nicely comfortable. It's about chair seat height off the ground. Uh, a good raised bed will allow air or heat from any of the fire to work its way underneath the bed, as you can see here. And that heat that's generated will come up through the bottom of the bed and heat you from below. A good raised bed will keep you up off the ground and eliminate the heat loss due to conduction of your body on the cold ground. And the raised bed raises the body up high into the trapped bubble of warmed air within the super shelter. The second component of the super shelter is the bubble. So when I say bubble, keep in mind when I'm talking about the bubble, it refers to having the window closed like this. So I am now inside a polyethylene or plastic bubble. So <laughs> All right, so <laughs> ah! let's get this up out of the way so you can actually see my head. There we go. So the bubble. The bubble basically traps warmed air and prevents heat loss. Uh, the colder, heavier air sinks to the lower part of the shelter while the warm air is trapped in the upper layers of the shelter. The trapped bubble of warmed air is very efficient at capturing and preserving the heat within the shelter. And this is directly related to the efforts a person spends on maintaining a fire. The super shelter captures the bubble of warmed air and holds it around your body for a much longer time than in, in a open fronted shelter, which quickly and inefficiently loses its warmed air due to convection or the wind blowing through or leaky shelter interior. So a significant benefit to the bubble of warmed air is that you'll require a smaller fire and you will require less wood to get through a night, less stoking for the fire, and overall less heat for the shelter. This is why we call it the super shelter. It eliminates 
uh, a wasteful expenditure of energy on collecting a giant fire to, to heat an inferior or poor shelter. It makes it so efficient. So it was his steps. First of all, I had to realize that uh, make a complete bubble. If you poke a hole in the ceiling of your super shelter with, with a finger, the heat loss out of that is enough to cause people to say, hey, what's the big deal? I'm not really getting much effect. No, you've got to be very strict in creating that bubble with no holes in it. And generally, when you could do something similar with straight poles, the failure that most people do is they can't do a really good job at the point where they where the poles go through and you're trying to and people say yeah this lean to doesn't work as good and it's because they did de they don't it's seal leaking. off that that yeah. leak it. it's leaking so at their ridge pole so, so you yeah. gotta really be careful to to create this bubble that has no leaks in it yeah. and anyway the long burning fire plus the super shelter now the long burning fire doesn't have to be as big so one third so it'll last, the amount of fire that keeps you warm in front of an open uh, type shelter, it'll keep you warm for three nights in front of a, of a, uh, of a super shelter because it can be that much smaller because all it has to do is heat up the in enclosure of the bubble you're producing. Absolutely. The reflective ceiling, and in this case the mylar blanket that's in here, uh, it reflects the heat from the fire back towards your body. The mirrored ceiling reflects the heat towards the uh, back of the shelter too. So if you think of the fire, the fire heat comes up like this. Uh, if the mylar is, in, is built into the shelter correctly, it will be roughly perpendicular to the fire. That allows for a great reflection of those heat rays and it'll bounce those heat rays back to the back side of your body and in even some cases, many cases, the ceiling will bounce that the heat rays down to this part of the shelter, which is often the place that gets cold, especially in bitter cold. So if you don't have a reflective ceiling in your shelter and you just have, let's say, a wood-backed shelter or even just a plastic-backed shelter, um, the, the straight line radiance of the fire warms only a relatively small amount of your body. It doesn't warm your backside and it doesn't get down to those hard to reach places in the shelter. Another benefit to having that uh, reflective mylar ceiling in the back of the shelter is it just adds another layer to the shelter. So basically there's three layers in this shelter right now. There's the plastic exterior, then there's the breathable, uh, in this case bed sheet, or in other cases uh, parachute layer, so that's number two, and then there's the reflective uh, mylar blanket. That's the third layer. Each layer adds more insulation and heat carrying capacity to the shelter. It helps to actually prevent condensation from dripping right onto your body and the condensation is more apt to gather on the plastic exterior and not on the mylar, so it helps a little bit with con condensation. Let's talk about the fourth uh, component of a super shelter, which is the window. So the window, if I was to pull this down, <laughs> like that, all the way down and hunker in for the night, this is what we consider the window or the polyethylene fronted window. Now I'm gonna lift it back up so you can hear me and see me talk. Now, that window basically allows heat into the shelter and traps it inside the shelter. It prevents smoke from entering into the shelter and, of course, entering into your lungs. It prevents sparks from landing on the clothing and your bed. It keeps the insects out of the shelter. Uh, it can be raised up and perched up as an awning up here. So if you're active and awake and sitting in your shelter working on something, you can actually prop it up with ropes or sticks or whatever and create an awning or a workspace underneath. Uh, it keeps the rain out of the shelter and it keeps the wind from removing heat uh, from the shelter via convection. So something happens in the rays from the fire, the heat rays will come through and they'll actually hit the plastic 
and they will transfer to the other side just like a greenhouse. It's not a hard thing to figure out really. Uh, we see this in our own homes when we have a nice south facing window and the sun shines on it. It suddenly warms, it effectively warms the interior of your house. We see this in our automobiles all the time. You park a vehicle outside, the sun shines on that window and heats the interior of your vehicle uh, a great deal. And surprisingly, the front, the window in the front sheds sparks really well. Now eventually you do get a few spark holes through it, eventually, but if your wall, your window, let's just do this. If your window is nice and vertical like mine is, okay, you will be kind of surprised to see when you sleep in a shelter like this that sparks will hit it and just bounce off and fall down. Well, uh, they actually don't stick on there very much and create big holes. It doesn't melt it out. Uh, it just it just works so wonderfully. Now, if I was to, of course, change the angle and lean this out so that it's sloped backwards, then it may capture sparks more so. Plus, I'm in danger of getting the bottom of this plastic to melt because it's so close to the fire. But when it's built properly, nice and vertical, or even past vertical, the sparks tend to just bounce off of it and fall down. The heat transfers through the plastic and warms the interior bubble to a great degree. And then you've got the situation that part of the structure has got a clear material which actually is more translucent to the infrared heat, the, re, the heating rays of the fire than window is. So glass is much more resistant to allowing pass radiance through whereas uh, polyethylene, and I learned many years later, it was far more translucent to infrared or whatever radiance you get to the fire than any glass would. You yeah. want to test this yourself with a stove that has a glass window so that when you got a good fire going in the stove, open the window, see how close you can get your hand to the glowing fire and you find that if you held your hand about the same place where the window would be, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's impossible. Close the window and now you just don't have to touch the glass all that light is coming through the glass, but uh, you, if you touch the glass, of course, uh, the heat, but you're holding it very, very close there, and it's not getting to you because yeah. the glass really inhibits the emergence of that. So anyway, so now you've got the situation that you've got something like an igloo, but it doesn't melt because the snow is not involved. And you can light a fairly big fire. It's got to be an awfully big fire that will melt the polyethylene that uh, that's between the fire and your in the interior of your shelter yeah and so you don't have to have such a big fire now because uh, more of the w uh, warmth that you're trying to capture is so the fire might be half of what you really need from an open fire in front of an open sure yeah let's just tuck that out of the way and let's talk about the fifth component of the super shelter which is fresh air exchange. Uh, I get this question a lot. How do you breathe in there? Aren't you creating toxic fumes in the inside? What about carbon monoxide? You know the questions go on and on and on as to uh, it sounds like an unhealthy place to, to seal yourself inside a plastic bubble. Well that's you know those are good questions but the truth of it is uh, in these shelters it never really seems to seal the plastic right down to the edge. You'd have to work very hard to get a complete seal all the way around. The ground is rough, there's sticks and debris everywhere, so a certain degree of fresh air just works its way underneath. But in the design of this, this uh, super shelter, as you'll see in the videos on, on how to build it, uh, we've incorporated a very efficient and very effective fresh air exchange area in the lower part of the shelter at the back. The, this fresh air exchange area is permeable. It's like a permeable skin and it allows fresh air into the shelter without allowing insects and wind to get inside. The parachute or the ripstop nylon or in this case bed sheets um, as well as providing a permeable portion to let fresh air in, it helps keep the shelter together in strong winds especially if uh, thinner plastic and small uh, framework is set up. It just holds the structure in place. And the breathable fabric also allows fresh air exchange to be below 
the bubble of warmed air. So we build it in such a way that the fresh air exchange occurs back, back here in the lower portion of the shelter. And you know, it really, if it really got to a place where it was so bad that you found the air and the quality inside wasn't great, getting up to be that good, then you just simply lift up the window and let air move in. You know, I've done that lots of times. In fact, many times when I'm sleeping in the shelter at night and the front window is down in front of me and closed off, you get so darn hot that I have no choice but to reach down and pull up some of the shelter or lift the window to, just to let some cool air in because you're just too darn hot inside. So uh, it's really not a problem. Fresh air exchange is really not an issue in this shelter. I'd like to finish with a few general comments on why the super shelter is so awesome. So number one, you can build it anywhere and it can be built on uneven ground. It doesn't require standing trees or ridge poles. It can be built in open spaces. It can be built in the great timber forests. It can be built on a beach, right? You can build it wherever you want to. Uh, it can be portable. There is a way to build the framework of the bed such that you can actually have two rails and pick up your bed and drag it over to a new location. Now you don't drag it real far. Uh, the best uh, example of why you would make this shelter portable or movable is, is this. Let's say that in the deep winter of the northern forest where I am, uh, you spend four, maybe five days in one area. Well, in cold weather, and I'm talking about minus 30, minus 35, minus 40 degrees Celsius, um, you'll find that you burn up a, a fair amount of wood. And instead of going out and taking all the effort to go and bring the wood back to your shelter, you can sometimes just pick up your shelter and drag it closer to the wood, especially if there's a lot of wood just a short ways away. The super shelter is easy to set up and it's temporary. It packs down small into your everyday survival kit. It's very lightweight. The materials are really inexpensive. So the plastic, the bed sheet and the mylar is easily under $50. And if it gets abused or you lose it or it gets ripped or it does get some spark holes in it, it's no big loss. You just build another one using inexpensive materials. Uh, it's disposable. You can just throw it away if you're uh, done with it. And it works better than any other shelter in all seasons and all environments. It really does. So in the next video uh, in this series, we're going to tackle the question, why not just bring a tent? Or in other words, why is a super shelter better than a tent? I hope you'll join us for that video. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share to all your friends within your community. Uh, and I hope you have a chance to go out and make your own super shelter soon.